Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 24. In this lecture, we'll discuss the dot product. This topic is covered in Chapter 7, our textbook by Sir Wei and Jouette. In this lecture, we want to discuss the dot product operation, which is really a mathematical topic. However, we will need the dot product in order to continue our discussion of work and energy. So to define the dot product, first consider two vectors. Imagine you have two vectors, A and B. A has components AX, AY, whereas B has components BX, BY. So these are the X and Y components of each one of those vectors. Given the Cartesian components, the X and Y components, of course, you can calculate the magnitude and the orientation of each vector. So let's just say vector A has a magnitude A and an angle theta sub A, while B has a magnitude B and angle theta sub B. The dot product of these two vectors is also known as the scalar product, and it is defined by this equation. Notice here, we're basically talking about the multiplication of vectors. We have already learned how to add vectors and how to subtract vectors. Here, we're effectively learning how to multiply vectors, or at least we're learning about one way to multiply vectors. So the dot product is simply written using a dot. So a dot b refers to the dot product of these two vectors. And to calculate this dot product, you need to take the magnitude of the first vector multiply it by the magnitude of the second vector, and then multiply that by the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. So remember that vector A is pointing in one direction, theta A. Vector B is pointing in a different direction, specified by theta B. If I subtract these two together, then I get the angle between the two vectors. So the theta that shows up here is really theta a minus theta b. It turns out this is one way of calculating the dot product. There is an alternative definition of the dot product, which relies not on magnitudes and orientations, but on x and y components. So another way to calculate the scalar product or the dot product of, this, of the same two vectors is to multiply their x components multiply their y components, and then add the result. Notice in both of these cases, what we're getting is a real number, a scalar quantity. So we're taking two vectors, and by multiplying them, we're getting a scalar, not a vector as you might expect. Both of these two equations or definitions give you exactly the same result. Which one should you be using on your homework or on an exam? Well, it depends on what information is given to you. If the magnitudes of the vectors are given to you in a problem and you're asked to calculate the dot product, then this first definition is better. On the other hand, if the x and y components are given to you, then this second definition is, is better. Both definitions ultimately produce the same exact number, although I'm not going to prove that fact in this class, I think that proof probably belongs in your math class. Going forward, I'll refer to this top equation as the magnitude definition of the dot product, and I'll refer to this bottom equation as the component definition of the dot product. On the previous slide, I gave you two equations uh, to calculate the dot product of vectors. However, I did not really explain where these equations come from. I did not derive them. A full discussion of their derivation really belongs in your math class, but it is helpful to have some geometric interpretations of the dot product. It turns out the dot product can be viewed as the projection of one vector onto the other. What do I mean by a projection? Well, you can think of a projection as the a quote-unquote shadow of one vector on the other when lighted from above. Okay, remember that vectors are essentially arrows, and we can think of many everyday objects as if they are arrows, as if they are vectors. For example, here on the left, I have a street lamp, and this street lamp is illuminated from above by another light source, pres presumably the sun. As the sun shines on this street lamp, it casts a shadow on the wall. 
and the shadow can be thought of as the projection of the street lamp onto the wall. Similarly, on the right here, I have a person that is standing and the person is illuminated from above by the sun or maybe a street lamp or some ceiling lighting. And that lighting is casting a shadow on the ground. We can think of the shadow as the quote unquote projection of the person on the ground. Now notice that the size or length of the shadow uh, does not have to be equal to the size or height of the person. Those could be very different. The sizes depend on the angle from which the, the person is illuminated and how far away the light source is. So to make all that precise, people talk about the dot product. A little more precisely, this is what I mean. Imagine you have two random vectors. Here's a blue vector and here's a uh, a green vector. I'm calling them A and B. You can think of B as the street lamp and you can think of A as the wall. Or you can think of B as the person and A as the floor on which we're casting a shadow. Um, the orientation of these two isn't that important, but there is some angle between them. I'm calling it theta and I'm imagining that at least in this upper case, the, um, the vectors are being illuminated from above and as you can see the light rays are coming down forming a perpendicular angle relative to vector A. So here what I'm trying to do is project vector B onto vector A. In other words vector B is casting a shadow on vector A because the light rays are perpendicular to vector A. It turns out if you're interested in the length of this shadow, which would be this region here, this length over here, then you would calculate the dot product. It turns out the definition of the dot product that we saw in the previous slide is designed so that when you calculate the dot product and divide it by A, you get exactly the length of this shadow here. You might say, well, I'm interested in the shadow of A onto B. So what's the projection of A on B? In that case, we would have to illuminate the situation a little bit differently. This time, the light rays must be perpendicular to vector B. And in that case, this is the length of the shadow. This is the length of A's shadow onto B. And that length is again calculated using the dot product. The results on this slide are not so important for us in physics and you will not be tested on it. It's very important that you know how to calculate the dot product. But in case you're wondering where those crazy definitions are coming from, they're motivated by this discussion of projections and shadows. Calculating the dot product of two vectors is going to be very important to us. And so we must make sure that we can do it accurately. To do so, we need to know the angle between the two vectors. Remember that at least one of the formulas for the dot product involved the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. Calculating the angle between two vectors can be somewhat confusing from time to time. And so in this context, there's a very specific recipe or procedure for calculating the angle between two vectors. When you're asked to calculate the angle between two vectors, you must first Put the vectors tail to tail so move the vectors without changing their orientations so that the tail of one coincides with the tail of the other one and then read the smallest positive angle between the two vectors in other contexts we might use negative angles but not in this context when it comes to calculating the dot product the theta the angle that we plug into the formula must be the smallest positive angle when the vectors are placed tail to tail. For example, here are two vectors. We have a blue vector and we have a green vector and I've given you some angles here. If I ask you to calculate the dot product of these two vectors, what angle would you use? What angle would you plug into the dot product formula? 40 or 140? Well, notice that in this configuration, the vectors are not tail to tail. The head of one coincides with the tail of the other one. 
So first I'm going to move either the green or the blue so that they're tail to tail. You can see on the right, they're in the correct configuration. So the tails coincide. And I now look at the angle between these and I see that the angle must be 40 degrees. Some of you might be thinking, well, the angle should be minus 40 degrees. No, it should be the smallest positive angle. Some of you might be looking at a different angle altogether. You might be thinking about this angle here, which is 320 degrees, and that would be wrong as well. In the context of the dot product, the angle between these two vectors, the smallest positive angle between them, is exactly 40 degrees. So 40 is the number that you want to plug into the formula for the dot product. So make sure you're obeying this procedure carefully, otherwise you'll end up miscalculating the dot product. I should mention that there are some trigonometric identities that sometimes are helpful in this context. You might remember from your trig days that sine of 180 minus theta is equal to sine of theta and that cosine of 180 minus theta is equal to minus cosine of theta. So occasionally, if you confuse 40 with 140, you'll still get something that looks like the right number, but you might get a minus sign in front of it. If that's happening to you a lot, it's probably because you're not obeying this procedure as outlined above. So make sure you follow this procedure, although in some rare cases, you'll see that these trigonometric identities can help you to accidentally get the right answer. Let's wrap up this lecture with a practice problem. Vector A has magnitude 2 and vector B has magnitude 1.5 as shown in the figure. Calculate their dot product. So I have vector A and vector B and the magnitudes or the lengths are given and the angle, or at least some angle, is given, and this is 60 degrees. We want to calculate the dot product, and for this calculation, we're going to use the magnitude definition of the dot product. Remember, there are two ways of calculating the dot product. Since the magnitudes are given to me, I'm going to use the magnitude definition, which says take the magnitude of vector A, 2, multiplied by magnitude of vector B, and then multiply it by the cosine of the angle between them. Notice in this case, the angle between them is not 60 degrees because in the configuration shown, the two vectors are not tail to tail. If you want to place them tail to tail, you would have to pick up vector A and maybe drop it off like so over here uh, without changing its orientation or magnitude. I haven't been able to do that precisely here. But anyways, if you move vector A over so that the tails coincide at this point, you would then see that this angle here is 120 degrees. I'm getting the 120 by taking 180 degrees and subtracting 60 degrees from it. So the number that I will plug into the formula is going to be 120, and now I can put this into my calculator and I will find that a dot b is minus 1.5. Here's another one. This time I'm giving you vectors a and b in terms of uh, components. So two different vectors. Vector a is 3 comma 1. Vector b is minus 2 comma minus 4. Calculate the dot product. Since the components are given to me, since the Cartesian components are given to me, it's probably better to use the component definition of the dot product. In the component definition, we're going to take the x components and multiply them together. So I'm going to take 3 and multiply it by minus 2. I'm also going to take 1 and multiply it by minus 4. And then I'm going to add those results together. And when I do that, I find that the dot product is minus 10. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.